for that mutation, we're focusing on the metabolism of a, of a tumor. So if you think about cancer, what the tumor is feeding on is certain metabolites. Some tumors take oxygen, some tumors take glucose, some tumors take glutamine, glutamine. It's important to understand what the tumor is sensitive to, because that's what's going to de decide how quickly a tumor is growing. So we capture that sensitivity from, from genomic data, and then we have a spatial 3D model that says how different is it, where are the blood vessels, and where are these metabolites going to go to, in order to be able to answer that question. And then we build individual drug models um, for each one of the standard of care mathematically. Ultimately, with the goal of starting from one to three, so you could see a patient's personalized anatomy, anatomy of the tumor, and that the smallest unit in an image, we're modeling how a patient is responding. So week over week, you can predict how a tumor is shrinking. So a surgeon can plan. A medical oncologist can better decide what the right therapy is. The patient can understand what, how much response they're expecting to see and then be able to be very precise on the treatment. So it's an entirely software-based platform. So this is going to be a class two FDA device, a software as a medical device, that will be used in the treatment planning phase. So as soon as a patient's diagnosed and goes to a medical oncologist, the patient's data is imported into the application, and then the physician can walk a patient through, here are the different treatments that are available in standard of care for you. And then run simulations, similar to Google Maps, similar to the weather application, to be able to understand week over week how much shift there is going to be or how much shrinkage there is going to be in the tumor. So this is the application itself. So this is an example, and this is a very common case. And um, for some of the oncologists out there, this is before Keynote 522, so you might see slightly different um, options here. But this is a 74-year-old patient. And at that age, often the decision that needs to be made is, you know, is the, is the toxicity going to be beneficial for that particular patient or not? In breast cancer, as we note, the chemotherapeutics are very toxic, but there's a very strong standard of care. So as a physician can look at this patient, so this is a T3 tumor, there are a variety of options that are generally acceptable in standard of care, right? A five-dose a five combination, a three-dose combination, a two-dose combination, based on the doctor and physician's appetite of what the risk benefit is going to be. But it's hard to know that risk benefit for that individual up front. And that's where the application comes in, where the physician can select here are the therapies, and unfortunately this patient couldn't handle immunotherapy, and the physician wanted to know, could we forego anthracycline? That is known to cause lifelong cardiotoxicity. That is known to cause um, secondary leukemia in a number of patients. But wanted to understand, could we forego um, anthracycline in that patient? So what they did was simulate, both with and without anthracycline, what they expect the response to be in this setting. So you can see here, with or without the drug, the tumor shrinks within eight weeks, and the patient is, has a very high likelihood of achieving PCR. So what we're doing is by providing this information a priori to the physician and the patient is allowing them to have a more individualized risk benefit assessment of that. And that way they can choose when to de-escalate, when to escalate thoughtfully on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. The first indication we're getting approval for is, um, is early stage breast cancer in the neoadjuvant setting. So this is an example for some of the patient advocates and past patients out there. This is an example of the report that we're generating that compiles the patient's data, pathology, imaging, the treatment options that may be available to that patient. So this is another example in the HER2 positive setting. So a patient could get TH, which is one, one chemotherapy and one targeted therapy, two chemotherapies and one targeted therapies. Uh, two chemotherapies and two targeted therapies would all be eligible based on uh, based on this patient's profile. So that information is provided to the patient via report. And based on the physician's input and discretion on what therapies they may be eligible for, simulations are run that you can see visually if the patient is likely to achieve PCR, what that likelihood is. Uh, PCR, by the way, is a pathological complete response that is known to be an important prognostic marker in early stage breast cancer, which is the disappearance of the tumor after neoadjuvant therapy. So you can see with each one of those therapies, what's the likelihood of the patient achieving a complete response, what the likelihood of recurrence is, um, as well as what the toxicity or the, the risk of each one of those therapies are. And so that the, the shared decision making can be had more thoughtfully and there's a forum for that to be had. The applications are pretty broad, um, you know, and that's why we're very blessed to ha have created a visual software as a medical diagnostic that is predicting longitudinal data. So if I just go back here for a second. 
So the application is in the surgical planning as well, where we're going to deploy an intended use with the FDA for surgical planning to help surgical oncologists assess the benefit of neoadjuvant therapy, especially in uh, certain subtypes of breast cancer, where neoadjuvant therapy or adjuvant therapy is a big decision point early. By being able to predict what the tumor may look like after the therapy, they're able to assess how much benefit they would get. Um, the use is also for pathologists, so to understand where there may be residual disease. So as they take out the, the remaining tumor or take out part of the breast, they can assess where to look. But the utility will also be in long-term prognosis in helping physicians and patients understand. So broad uses, but we'll focus on this thoughtfully over the course of our journey. A lot of time for the company has been spent on clinical evidence. Um, and generating clinical evidence, so validation is key, as, as any oncologist here or physician here will tell you. So we've been uh, working with a number of sites, running studies to validate when we predict how accurate are we. And as you can see, and I won't go too deep in the data, over a thousand patients have been validated with the application. So predicting multiple endpoints of a pathological complete response, we see an accuracy of over 92%. Being able to predict volume and how the tumor shrinks, so you can see here, this is an example of a tumor shrinking as predicted by the application in red, and then as confirmed by the radiologist in blue, as you can see in that shape. So what the application is also trying to capture is the biological underpinnings of how tumors evolving over the course of that journey. And the error we see in volumetric prediction, which is the surgical use case, is under 4%, which is really exciting. The platform is designed for all solid tumors, but as you know, in the regulatory setting, we have to be very focused in terms of what to go after. And we, the reason we picked early stage breast cancer was, um, as, and as you'll hear throughout SWOG this year, in the breast committees, there is a need for upfront biomarkers that can help physicians decide how to de-escalate, how to escalate, especially in light of what's happening in the triple negative setting. But we intend over 2025, as we grow the company, to be able to expand to all solid tumors with lung and prostate being the next with the company. We were talking to um, our, one of our advisors, Donald Berry, who does a lot of the breast cancer designs, and he asked us to share this with you. That's, this is the way he thinks about this, is in the 1950s, how do we used to look at weather? You used to be on the TV, um, you'd look at a weatherman, you'd note down what the weather would be in the next few days. In, in 2000s, how do we look at the weather? We all pull up our phones, look at what the weather is going to be and how that's gonna change over, over the course of it, and we can get that answer in an instant. We think of um, cancer and cancer care very similarly and are trying to bring that level of evolution um, into the cancer care clinic. So in terms of evolution of precision medicine, I think there are, there are deeper questions that need to be answered that we're, able, that we're not able to answer with the data that's available today. So it's, you know, could we right-size therapy for patients? Who do we need to escalate? Who do we not need to escalate? Things that we're modeling from a biomarker perspective is how much of the drug is actually getting into the tumor. Is there a drug delivery issue in a particular patient where the drug might not be reaching it? How resistant is the patient to a particular drug? And bringing that, that information together to be able to predict um, upfront some of the key endpoints that clinicians and patients look to understand before deciding on their treatment plan. So I'm very blessed to have um, shared this with you. We are looking to work uh, a lot with some of the SWOG collaborators on a variety of different topics. So one is continued clinical validation, being able to use um, the SWOG patient populations as well as SWOG clinical trials to continue validating. We're also starting to deploy this clinically um, for parallel use across a number of different sites where this can be used from a patient experience and, and research standpoint. And then are also sponsoring a number of investigator initiated trials to use tumor scope as a biomarker um, for novel therapeutics as well as a biomarker for de-escalation trials. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the time there. Don, I told you I'd keep you on time. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, so if anybody is online and has a question, go ahead and put it into the chat, and I'm happy to ask Dr. Pandey, but we can open the floor as well. You know, I think just to start us off, if you look at something like breast cancer, mm -hmm. you know, um, we are in an era where um, we're doing subtype specific. Sure treatments, do you see this technology as having differential use by subtype? Absolutely. That's a great question, Don. And, you know, <coughs> the decisions that are being made in the clinic vary by subtype, 
right? The therapies that are being given in the clinic vary significantly by subtype. So you're, you're absolutely right. I think there are commonalities between, so if you think about the, the HER2 positive setting and triple negative setting, the early endpoint everybody goes after there is the endpoint of a pathological complete response. In the luminal setting, pathological complete response has not shown to be prognostic. So the focus in triple negative is pathological complete response. On the luminal side, it's more about tumor reduction or size reduction of the tumor. Go ahead, Stephanie. Yeah. Just repeat the question for people. Yeah, absolutely. And the question Stephanie was asking was, you know, what are we doing to incorporate diversity? So, by virtue of being in Chicago, um, and by virtue of working with organizations like University of Alabama, we're trying to create a validation set that is representative of the real world. Um, in fact, the validation that we've done so far, over 30 to 40 percent of the population is African American, um, which is very important, right? African American population, just in terms of um, long-term outcomes very different and we're you know we haven't been able to fully understand why um, and bringing the multimodal data together like we are in the application starts to elucidate some of that and that's the plan so we've we've had a number of publications around you know understanding the variation in African Americans and Caucasian breast tumors um, that happy to share with all of you if you're interested go ahead yeah go ahead Mm -hmm. clinical trials. So I was thinking if this can be used with our uh, biomarker-driven clinical trials where patients can have it as an option because we don't know for sure that it's going to be you know, effective because it's still a clinical trial. So, you know, just like wanting to... That's a, that's a great question. And the question was, could, they, could this be used in conjunction, if I understand correctly, with the current biomarker trials and current biomarkers? Absolutely. The way we've designed the technology, the reason we use, instead of, tr if those of you are familiar with traditional machine learning, is you take a bunch of data, you put it in a, in a model, and then you predict what will happen to the next patient. What we've done here is, using first order principles, we're actually mathematically modeling how a tumor is changing. So very little data is needed to be able to create a new model, but at the same time, new data can be integrated. So new biomarker-led study, that biomarker could be integrated into it, into the application. So can people come to the mic and just introduce yourselves for the people also joining by Zoom? Hi. Um, Hi, Don. So yeah, Don Hirschman. Um, <laughs> so my question is uh, about how to incorporate this into SWAV, right? So this is super interesting, but it's always good to think like, okay, we're all here. What, how can we use this? you know yeah. here so would the goal would be to maybe since you're doing so much work with the validation to try to figure out could you use this for a de-escalation trial mm -hmm. or do you have work in terms of change after the first cycle of treatment that helps you predict whether or not patients should stay on that treatment or mm -hmm. switch to something else yeah. like what would be a good design of this system that we could test in a prospective study. A great question, Don, and and thank you for thank you for the uh, for the focus here. Uh, no, we appreciate that. You know, I think we honestly we think there is a the challenge with the technology, um, and we're very cognizant of it. Is is the breadth, right? We can deploy it in thirty different ways. Um, unfortunately, the company is not large enough yet to be able to do that. So we have to be very thoughtful. So everything from precision dosing, which is becoming important, how much of a dose do you give up a particular drug instead of maximal dosing to, you know, an immunotherapy-based de-escalation, which is who gets, you know, five therapies from Keynote 522 or who can avoid the anthracycline. Um, the focus, you know, for, in terms of immediate use, and Donna had some early conversations around it, is, is twofold, is, you know, utilizing this as a biomarker for de-escalation and being able to use that for either patient selection or patient enrichment in biomarker trials. So finding which patients are likely to have, um, likely to have complete responses without certain chemotherapeutics. That's one. The other is that we're focusing on is decision impact. To be able to say, how does this change behavior of physicians? Be able to assess that within the SWOG network. But at the same time, does it improve patient experience? The hypothesis here, and part of the reason of making this visual and focusing on what the patient gets out of this was to improve patient experience, was to improve shared decision making. And, and that's an area we'd love to collaborate with <coughs> SWOG investigators on as well. I think the other place, come to the mic, Jeff. The other place that might be really interesting is really the questions of residual disease. Absolutely. primary therapy, if we were able to launch into a queue 
of testing novel strategies in an umbrella setting, maybe, that might be a place where actually these kinds of predictive yep. technologies may be able to be validated. Yeah, and I presented, you know, to your point, I present, what I presented today was more of the clinical utility. There's a translational aspect of it where the data that's generated is a biomarker on its own. So, for example, the example I gave you was drug delivery. So by being able to delineate patients that may have poor drug delivery versus patients that have better degree, that in itself is a biomarker, but that data is not readily available. That data is being generated. Absolutely. Jeff, gotcha. um, Mike, I think you've kind of alluded to this, but um, are you developing uh, decision aids for the patients as well as, because th this is primarily uh, an aid for the physician, you know, t to make decisions, but what about decision aids for the patient? And maybe that's an area that SWOG could contribute as well. No, that yeah. is the, you know, I, I, I'll share this with you, and everybody has a personal story in, in cancer, but, you know, we built this because of the experience I went through with my mother where, um, you know, there, there, was, there was a lot of data. So she was, she's, she was diagnosed with HCC. There was just a lot of data, and I knew enough to be dangerous. So I said, let's get the foundation medicine liquid biopsy. Let's do the newest three Tesla imaging. Let's do, um, let, let's do whole exome sequencing. We'll take all this data to the oncologist, and we'll have a collaborative conversation. Guess what? You know, the data can't just be used like that, right? That patient, from a patient's perspective, we weren't, we didn't have a full understanding of it. That couldn't be used. There wasn't a decision aid to understand what that data meant, what the different treatments were, what the. So part of it, Jeff, you're absolutely right, is the first part of this, before you even get to the predictive nature of this, is all a decision aid and all a shared decision-making framework for the patient and the physician. You know, we did a large study of a number of breast cancer survivors when we started the company. And that was one of the reasons the focus where we asked them where they felt was the shortcomings in terms of conference the decision-making. Um, or where they felt was the most uncertain point in their treatment. And we assumed naively it was when they heard the words, you have cancer. Well, it was more in the treatment planning phase where they didn't understand how well the treatment was going to work, what the side effects were going to be, because the doctors do a great job talking about it, but when a patient's hearing, you know, here's what's going to happen, they're not really listening right after they've been diagnosed with the disease. So that aid to take home, you're absolutely right, Jeff. Um, great, great point. <laughs> There's, okay, the, uh, one more question, then Becky can, um, can um, go as well. Yeah, Becky Johnson from Multicare. Hi, hey, um, so what is the interface with the electronic medical record system, and how burdensome will it be if we do proceed with clinical trials for the, the teams to upload data? Great question, Becky. A um, little bit early on the integration on the EMR side, the more important integration for us was the, with the PAC system, because this is imaging-based to be able to take images directly. Um, in lieu of not having direct EMR integration to get some of the pathological data, which most times is, is a PDF file or, a, or the report itself, right? There's not discrete data there. We allow the physician just to check some of the key markers that, that they have found as part of the input process. Eventually, the strategy is both two-way integration to be able to take that report, read that report, populate that for the patient, as well as send the report and the link back to the EMR as well. Mike. <laughs> Mike. You're in trouble. <laughs> so one, we had one question on Zoom by Samantha Wright. Um, you had mentioned that you were co uh, collaborating with multiple institutions. And mm -hmm. about what institutions were you working with? So we work with about 31 institutions. We're hoping to bring, start working with Lifespan here. That's why Stephanie and uh, Don, I'm looking at you. But, uh, um, you know, we work with a number of university, you know, Chicago-based locations, University of Arizona. So we've been trying to work with a mix of academia as well as community, just because the, the patient population, the treatment paradigms are so different. And this isn't just for, you know, academia. This is designed for where 60% of patients get care, which are rural community areas. Uh, Dr. Graf and Dr. Karam, I will invite you to the mic if you have a question. Yeah, Stephanie Graf Brown. Um, from a translational science piece, how <coughs> much do you understand how the 3D modeling works in response to various different treatments? We know, like, for example, with immunotherapy, some people have very inflammatory responses, and that might change. Well, you might get a very robust initial response that may not translate to a pathologic complete response because yep. the inflammatory microenvironment changes, changes. drug delivery. So from a translational science question, are there still more modeling to be done with your tool? For sure. You know, and, and a lot of the modeling is actually drug-oriented. As the drug mechanism of actions evolve, that's where a lot of the, 
the underlying modeling and work still needs to happen from a roadmap perspective. I'll give you a, you know, since you brought up immunotherapy, immunotherapy is a big area of focus for us. And from a translation standpoint, what we're seeing is it's metabolic markers in the microenvironment like hypoxia um, that are also indicative of the benefit patients get. Well, you know, you're not going to get that from just PDL1. So, you know, if you think about it two ways, it's the first is the spatially resolved model of a tumor. And what we can model is how the tumor evolves without therapy. And that's important. What are the differences in, you know, in, in metabolites and what are the differences in gradients? That brought together with various mechanisms of actions of therapies um, is what makes it predictive. And the data that's generated then is indicative of why it's predictive. But to your question, Stephanie, absolutely, there's a, you know, there's there's going to be a constant evolution within the platform as, as the standard of care evolves and as we move to different indications. And Dr. Curran with the last question. Yes. Um, so the question was uh, basically when they mentioned the EMR, mm -hmm. I think this is the greatest challenge in clinic for yeah. us and for the patients because we have so many, uh, you know, so many uh, companies giving us information and yep. patients might have also the biopsies or liquid biopsies from right. other institutions. Problem is that if these things are in so many places and if they're not in the patient's chart, I think legally also it's not right. Like we don't know if the patient was EGFR positive yeah. or yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? So I mean, I think there should be a way um, that these pieces of information should be incorporated in the patient chart, the EMR, sure. so that we can get access to it. Even if I'm not there, maybe another covering physician is able to know the report. You're but if right. we're having the same biases, then this should help, I think. So. Yeah, that's, you know, thank you so much. That means a lot um, for you to say that. You know, that's, for us, that's been one of the challenges in the data. Before everything, the biophysical simulation, the, the most important thing we're doing is integrating disparate data to the platform. Right? Imaging doesn't connect to pathology. Pathology doesn't connect to, to necessarily to all the clinical data or BMI data. That's actually an important driver of, and we're trying to bring that together. But it is going to be important to drive use over time. We will need to send things back in a common common platform. Any other questions? All right. Well, Dr. Pandey will be here if anybody wants to um, um, also grab him for further Wonderful. questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. All right, so I'm just going to present from here because I'm on Zoom, and so people can actually see me, if that's OK. All right, good. So um, for those folks here who are new to digital engagement, and, I'm, I, and I purposely make this meeting open because we're touting social media and engagement, and so that just doesn't make the meeting closed. However, having said that, one of the charges of this committee is to run surveys. Um, and the surveys that run through digital engagement are ones that are cross committee. So, um, so for example, if the breast committee wanted to do a survey of its members, that we don't have jurisdiction over that review. But if the breast committee wanted to survey everybody within SWOG, then digital engagement comes in with a survey subcommittee. And the point is to prevent all of us from getting inundated with survey requests and you do not know where they're coming from. So this is what Dr. Blanke put in place. Um, one of the requests of the survey subcommittee is that any survey that comes through gets reviewed here at this meeting. Um, and to that point, I'm going to share a survey that was done for leadership and that if you were at the Oishi Symposium this morning, I believe some of this was shared as well. Um, and also let you know of a second survey. Both of these have been accepted to ASCO um, as, present, as posters. Um, and the one that was done by Scott Modler, Mara Barry, Elizabeth Henry, Tiffany Lucas, Ariel Marshall for something called the Collaboration for Outcomes Using Social Media and Oncology, looked at social media and wellness in both pediatric and adult oncologists. And it was a collaborative survey between SWOG and Children's Oncology Group. And I was just going to do a shout out to Dana Sparks, who did the heavy lifting to get this done. So that is going to be a poster discussion at ASCO. This is the one I'm going to present to this committee uh, currently. Uh, and what I will ask, it's a weird one coming from someone on social media, but I'm going to ask you not to share it. ASCO has a very specific policy about not sharing data prior to presentation. Granted, it was a poster, so do what you want. But I'm up here and saying you should, probably shouldn't share it. And again, this was really uh, done on the um, uh, uh, really serving this, the lead CRAs within SWOG. All right, so how does this work? 
Okay. So what we did was want to put the pulse on what all of our institutions are going through in terms of being short-staffed, um, morale being impacted negatively since the pandemic, and what that impact was on uh, the clinical trial infrastructure across the country. So um, we had a very specific demographic that was surveyed. It was 100 people that were um, uh, identified as the lead clinical research associates within SWOG. Predominantly women, predominantly um, born before uh, 1985, um, uh, predominantly not Hispanic, predominantly white. 48% uh, came from an academic medical center and 22% uh, represented an NCORE member institution. And in terms of their primary, primary role, we had um, them listed in specific categories. 17% were clinical research associates, over 50%, almost 60% were in leadership, and then others defined their own positions, as you can see here. And in terms of the clinical trial office, about almost 40% were in the medical director's role, 26% were research coordinators. So uh, in terms of trying to figure out how people are working in their institutions, we asked if they utilize an institutional IRB for non-SWOG work um, and whether or not personnel shortages was an experience since COVID. So 80, almost 80% 80 use an institutional IRB, not central, and 81% were experiencing a personnel shortage during COVID. So the experience you are having at your institution, the anecdotes are true that this, is a, this seems to be a nationwide issue. So we asked folks um, what it was um, uh, impacting. About half said IRB processes that the reviews had slowed. 27% said legal. 42% said it was a negative impact on how these trials were being financially reviewed. And 45% said that the leadership kept changing, there was nothing constant in their offices, and as a result, there was reduced support for the people still devoted to doing clinical research. Top reasons for leaving were listed here. This was in a, a, in a scale. Um, better pay, total score is 34, better opportunities and better flexibility. But if you look at dissatisfaction, just plain old burnout, 70, the score was 77. Um, uh, and then in terms of standard procedures, uh, this was a little bit uh, tricky. If you look at the numbers, you're not looking at 100 people. This is a subset of those had even access to these numbers. And we couldn't actually see uh, uh, that um, the FTEs, um, how many people resigned who were nurses or regular, we couldn't detect what the changes were. But I think this is an incomplete data set. If you would ask me to fill out the survey, I would be guessing, quite frankly. Okay, um, and uh, I think I'll stop there, but I think the point that we wanted to make for this group is that um, A, this is a problem, and now we have data to say it's a big one for all of us. B, we need to come up with solutions, and I think SWOG, I think there are members of the executive um, committee here, SWOG is aware of this, and we want to see what we can do to help. So I don't know if Dana, uh, uh, Don, any, Kathy, if you guys want to uh, provide any comment. Otherwise, just to go just to show you what the survey subcommittee does with its swag. Okay. Any comments? Yes. So first of all, thank you for doing this because we've all been talking about this for so long and to have data and numbers to sort of back it up, it's so important. Mm -hmm. So. I really, you know, appreciate the, the data to go along with everybody's impressions. It would be really interesting to see like a repeat of that to see if it's gotten better, mm -hmm. but also to maybe add some, if you do a repeat survey to see, you know, cause obviously it depends on where you are in the cycle of these things to see what kinds of things have made a difference so that we know what to support. like. Flex, you know, how much of clinical trials can be done remotely yep. in terms of providing that flexibility, flexibility to staff to be <clears> able <throat> to maybe work home from home a little bit more, like what kinds of modifications 
you know, or what, you know, can, can we advocate? Mm -hmm. And what, where can we put our research dollars in terms of trying to um, define, you know, better ways of doing like remote clinical trials and things like that? I think that's a great comment. One of the things that actually came out, and again, this is a group of people in leadership um, for the institutions, they were lead CRAs. There was a really big commitment from this group. They were still in it, you know. But what they were seeing was the hiring of more junior people and the lack of mentors to help them do it. And instead, taking these junior people who are maybe working on a trial through SWOG and just throwing them to the lions and watching them either burn out because this was the, the, the pressure's too much, um, but it's not how people had trained in the past. So that's another thing that we, we that had had come out from this. Um, yeah, comment, please. Please well, introduce I, yourself. Uh, I'm Hildy Dillon from uh, Patient Advocate on the Lymphoma Committee. This is really interesting, but I'm just wondering. I know that we have a whole section of the SWAG um, website that offers training opportunities for CRAs. Do we offer any grants through HOPE for their professional development um, that might help with this? It's natural that people um, might want to go back to school after a while. Um, is there any opportunity for us to help support that? Uh, I, Morgan or Joe? Morgan? Yes. What? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> there is support for our CRAs that come in, and we're looking at even how to incorporate more of our advanced practice providers, get them really engaged within the clinical trial infrastructure. I think the reason why the leadership really wanted to do this work was um, to raise the alarm bells that what we're doing now, we're not finding people who want to do this long term. Um, and there was one comment, you guys can make your way up to the mic, please. There was one comment as well from Samantha, um, and her comment, Samantha Wright, this is, Interesting, and it shows that we should be making trial efficiency the priority to make them easier to manage on the CRA and clinical side. That might help some of those uh, categories. Dr. Graf. Um, Stephanie Graf Brown. Um, I'm shiny new to SWAG, <coughs> so my comments are sort of historical from my time at Sarah Cannon and on the ASCO Research Community Forum, but these are themes that existed before the pandemic. It's been really hard to train and maintain uh, CRAs and other clinical research staff because there's co competition from industry which can normally pay a lot higher. Um, and so often, you know, I think that in partnership with other organizations like ASCO, which has the ability to do some legislative action and, um, um, you know, Capitol Hill sort of movement as funding for research increases, we can also talk about paying these staff appropriately and fighting because our oncology trials in particular have gotten infinitely more complex and so we're asking them to do much <coughs> more work on the trials that were opening in oncology and I think that mm -hmm. that's really important. I do love the earlier comment about mentorship for those patients because that's what all of us are hungry for and then there's a female physician leader named Julie Silver who's a PMR doc at Harvard who has several um, academic works published on the power of stay interviews. We all think about exit interviews when somebody's finally reached their breaking, breaking point and leaves an organization. We say, what went wrong? How could we have gotten you to stay? Um, and Julie has done some pioneering work around stay interviews where every year or six months you meet with somebody and say, you're really valuable. We want you to stay. How can we be investing to keep you here? And I think that that concept and strategies to, enter, uh, to implement that into all of our practices with junior faculty and people like CRAs is, is, is really important and something that we could consider implementing. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sam Guild. I'm a patient advocate with the melanoma community. So you kind of touched on it, um, and I thought it was very interesting that there was a lot of high percentage of women who responded. And so you probably collected this, and I'm sure we only seen a portion of the data, but I would be personally interested in knowing wh um, whether the issue of child care mm -hmm. um, was a big factor in what happened the last couple of years, um, simply because we know from a lot of the news that we've heard that women had to take on a large part of that responsibility when children mm -hmm. were online. 
and it, because if we're looking at um, helping to support some of these individuals financially, um, it's going to impact, unfortunately, I think, um, people's advancements in their careers. Because if these women were at home and putting more time making sure the children were at home and getting schooling, that this could impact them um, in the long run. Thank you, Samantha. I, I agree. Um, like we didn't ask about family structures within the interview itself, or within the survey itself. It was really about the roles. But there was a high proportion leaving because of the lack of flexibility to work from home. That much we do know. Jeff. Yep. Um, our experience has been um, a lot of the people that we had employed in the last maybe four or five years were um, people who wanted to go on, already knew before they even took this job that they wanted to go on for advanced education, even medical school, nurse, uh, advanced nursing school, et cetera. And, um, and part of it is we didn't have a career ladder, so they didn't really see the chance for advancement and mentorship and educational work, you know, as you mentioned yeah. earlier. So, um, but my other th uh, thought is um, maybe another survey could actually look at the more broadly, not just the leadership, but the people who are actually doing the job. And we might find some other things too, because the leadership doesn't always know, because people even during an exit interview, I'm not sure how honest yep. they are about the reasons, although. Uh, the reasons stated seem to be very much the, the ones that we've experienced at our institution, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think like we do everything else, we ought to see if there's anybody that has retained their staff and what strategies they use that were successful, mm -hmm. because that's how we yeah. copy what successful people do. Yeah, one in five did not experience yep. that loss. Morgan? Hi, Kathy Crew, one of the um, EOs for the NCOR committees. I think you could probably enrich this data, not just by doing a, a follow-up survey, but maybe doing some, um, doing more qualitative analysis and interviews of like a select group of the survey participants, because yeah. then you can get sort of a richer impression of like how they were responding to the, to the survey. Yeah, what you're seeing here, so I did, we were able to identify like five themes, but it was because we allowed this sort of open comment, but I think you're correct. The interviews would be a great way to sort of complement the data. Uh, Morgan Cox from the Hope Foundation. I uh, just wanted to note, because of Hildy's question, that every summer we open up a call for new uh, funding programs. So if there is a great idea that perhaps relates to this need, the foundation may be a good place to uh, submit a proposal. So if you want to talk to me about it or have other questions, um, We'll be out in the registration area the next two days, and I'd be happy to give you more information. That's great. I mean, again, I think there is a real push to really engage all of us at the at the mission of SWAG, um, and so any way that SWAG can do that, um, this is your opening to let us know. All right. So some fun stuff coming up next. I'm going to present something that uh, Dr. Al Bain from the Clinical Trials Partnership presented alongside AstraZeneca. This is an opportunity that AZ and we have been looking at to uh, try to launch um, a, an innovative digital clinical trial concept and question. I'm uh, going to show you four proposals that were discussed. And the reason really is to get you sort of thinking about what else we could be doing in digital uh, engagement, but also to show you where some of our members came from with some really great ideas. OK, can we get the next slides? I don't remember what they're titled. Ah, here it is. All right, so again, these were already presented. I'm going to see if Dr. Albain uh, wants to come on a uh, call as well after the presentation. All right, so we touched on four areas with digital tools. One was adver adverse event monitoring. There was a proposal looking at recruitment and retention novel biomarkers for early detection of toxicities, and then another um, uh, uh, registry study, again, to uh, come up with something innovative in terms of, uh, actually, no, this one was looking at the uh, early detection of neuropathy. Going through them, the adverse event monitoring was submitted by Arpeet Rao and um, Dr. Brahambat, 
and it was called Safe Cap, uh, preventing serious adverse events in cancer clinics with artificial intelligence and telehealth in the post-COVID era. They have developed a platform called Anchor, and this is um, fed all of the information from clinical trials and drug monographs um, to feed into a machine learning system to detect not only what symptoms arise, but when they're anticipated to arise. And it also builds in toxicity management into the system. And the way it works is on the left here. So um, the uh, patients go on to anchor with a specific drug and say, we know, we anticipate at two weeks, you're gonna start getting neuropathy. The patient starts getting queried a little bit before that about neuropathy, are you having any? If he says yes, then a, um, a chatbot kind of system kicks in and starts um, managing them and all of this interaction is fed back to the team. So he has, uh, he submitted this as a concept uh, in proactive reporting of treatment related toxicities in an effort to reduce burden on patients, improve satisfaction, increase adherence. Um, and using, again, an AI-generated system. Okay, so what it does, it generates these heat maps for FDA-approved agents using an algorithm, again, like I said, on FDA label and the monographs, uh, temporally looks at when these are to happen and then provides patient-level data, all of this information being trans, uh, transmitted. I'm not sure if it's embedded into electronic medical record systems, but these patient-reported outcomes are then transmitted to the team in real time. <clears throat> so he has it in use in 26 cancer clinics, and he showed um, subjective data that of the first 500 involved, there was a 52% reduction in adverse event rates versus historical controls. This is not peer reviewed. This was their experience based on Anchor. So what they um, proposed was a cluster randomized trial. Volunteers would be people with lung and, and or breast cancer on a single agent therapy. They could have had two cycles prior to the enrollment. The intervention would be what we do in clinic every day with Anchor. The comparator would be standard of care. The objectives would be to compare serious adverse events uh, and then also look at it as they occur by socioeconomic status and race. Looking at time on treatment, whether having anchor involved will prolong people being on therapy, progression-free survival, patient satisfaction, and then the site feasibility, whether this is something that was really implementable within sites. The second was on recruitment and retention. We heard about this at our last digital engagement meeting. It's a, um, uh, there is a startup called Reply All Health. They addressed this, I think, the last time we met in person, so that was in 2018. So this was a pilot study using a test messaging service to um, look at issues on recruitment and retention on trials. So we know that these are two pillars that govern the success of trials. One potential way that we can improve both is to increase the engagement of those folks on trials already, um, not only from the opening of the trial and while they're in it, but also to make sure that they get the results, which is still a big issue for all of us. So this model builds on um, Gorelick's model of the recruitment triangle, building on clinicians, volunteers, as well as family and friends. The aim would be to build communication among all of them, improve trust as a way to improve engagement while on clinical trials. Reply All Health is a text messaging routing system. It allows one user to send an individual text to their subscribers. So the way this works is you go on Reply All Health, I go on Reply All Health as a PI, I'm assigned a phone number, I can send that number to all the other PIs and say, if you want to figure out what's going on with this trial, subscribe to this service. And you'll get the messages. You could also go out to all your CRAs. And then your patients can also get that. And if they subscribe to the service, say they want their mom to know about what's going on, anyone can subscribe. There, is, there may be the ability 
to centralize who gets your messages. So if I just wanted text messages to PIs, it would be one way. If you wanted everyone to see it, it would go another way. Um, but it's all built into this reply all phone number that then gets sent out. It is bidirectional. They can collect messages that come back and then they can deliver it to whoever the, site, uh, the trial designated member is. Uh, texts are encrypted and they're stored in a Microsoft data center. So the proposal here was a pilot trial to assess the feasibility and outcomes when Reply All Health was used in the context of a prospective phase one or two trial. The volunteers would be the PI team and NCOR sites. The intervention would be access to this communication system. It's a pilot study, so there would be no comparator and the outcomes would be acceptability. Who uses it? Does the study team find it uh, uh, onerous or do they find it beneficial? Same questions for the volunteers, family, and friends. And then we could look at retention metrics, adherence to the study calendar, early discontinuation, or study withdrawal. The next was novel biomarkers for early detection of toxicities. This was proposed uh, by Dr. Jing Yi uh, with her mentor, Saad Usmani. It was Resort MM. This is also a tech that was presented here at DEE, I think three years ago, using Aura Ring. It's recognizing the early symptoms using Aura Ring in trials for multiple myeloma. Um, they really built into this about cytokine release syndrome as the reason why a lot of uh, uh, T-cell directed immunotherapies cannot be rolled out nationally. So if there was an early warning sign, a um, novel biomarker for example, that could predict who was going to get into trouble, it could help us really um, broaden uh, the availability of these uh, toxicities. So this builds on the Aura Ring, which is a wearable ring. And I have an example right here, if anybody wants to see it. Um, it measures heart rates, variability, t body temperature, respiratory patterns, sleeping patterns, and activity metrics, i.e. step counts. It would serve as a registry to harness this wearable data and then evaluate it for clinically important endpoints, not only for predictors for CRS, but is there a predictor for fatigue or for febrile neutropenia? So the volunteers here would be people enrolled in multiple myeloma studies at SWOG and potentially NCTN wide. The intervention would be the ring. There would be no comparator and it would be a passive biometric data collection, which after the fact we could then use to generate hypotheses of potentially what predicted endpoints like fatigue, febrile neutropenia, CRS. This could be anything like heart rate variability that went up and you know, two or three days before someone developed febrile neutropenia. But this could be, um, again, in the context of novel biomarkers. Uh, the targeted trials were already identified through the Myeloma Committee as these three. And then finally, early detection of toxicities. This was uh, Dr. Hertz's uh, proposal uh, to further the development and testing of a mobile app to monitor for chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. This is something that Dr. Hertz has really devoted time and effort within SWOG to develop. So it was nice to see this here, and with Hope Foundation funding. So the background, we all know CIPN is debilitating and long-lasting, or can be, and early detection is critical so that you can intervene and prevent it from getting any worse than it is already. They have built a first-generation app. It's right now on iOS called NeuroDetect. It is PROs and functional assessments of standing, strength, and dexterity. It is in testing. So the goal of this project would be to integrate this app-based functional assessment to improve CIPN detection and management. The volunteers would be people receiving treatment that carries a risk of neuropathy. The intervention would be NeuroDetect, which is, a, again, PROs plus a functional assessment. Comparator would be uh, patient-reported outcomes only. And the objectives would be to compare the incidence of severe uh, acute and chronic CIPN. So where these, so I want to first congratulate all of, uh, all of my colleagues presenting concepts. They were very, um, I think I can say that they were very favorably reviewed and discussed with AstraZeneca and we are currently waiting for their next steps. Now this is um, proposals of tech that's already out there. As we end the day, I'm gonna bring you two other companies which I think are just fascinating just so you know what else is coming out there. If you are interested in exploring 
ways to use anything that I just discussed. There is an appetite in the leadership at NCOR to sort of try to move this forward, perhaps as a companion um, study uh, or, or a sub-study in an ongoing clinical trial. But we have been um, okayed to do a digital engagement clinical trial that is um, not tied to one of the disease sites. Having said that, it may be easier to look at a disease site with a running trial and incorporate a sub-study. So that's all I was going to say. I don't know if Kathy Albain, did you want to say anything? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> I'm here in Chicago due to the ongoing care. I need to render my mother, so I'm missing everybody uh, deeply at this uh, first live meeting since the pandemic. Uh, Don, I thank you for all your work to date on this. I, I know you and I have talked about these latest proposals. Um, in parallel, AstraZeneca presented a series of, I think, kind of broad, spanning over a lot of areas um, that I wasn't quite sure what particular hypothesis they had reached yet. And I don't think they had. I don't um, and I know they've going back as well as we're charged with coming up. I mean, I think we do need to focus it with hypothesis and, and say, you know, these all sound neat, but uh, AstraZeneca is going to help fund these. That's the, that's the point, even if it's not tied to any of their drugs. Um, we'd like to, on one of our CTP trials that's about to open, uh, that is an easy funded, totally funded trial, consider something, uh, maybe in the way of toxicity monitoring, for example, but we are also interested in a standalone trial, as you pointed out. Um, SWOG CTP clinical trials partnerships, um, I'm sorry for using the abbreviation, some of you may not be aware, but we work with fully funded, <clears throat> fully industry funded trials that are jointly developed uh, by SWAG and uh, by industry that are not being funded by the NCI, um, but that are scientifically designed, co-designed, and not like a typical one-off industry trial that you're, you, we're all used to participating in it at our institution. So <clears throat> we have a subcommittee um, that's uh, looking into all of these, a task force of CTP and I think Frank DeSanto, Kathy Crew, Don Hirschman are on that subcommittee, Mike Fish. Um, so I don't know if any of them who are on this most recent call might also want to chime in, but I know we are charged with uh, determining what the next perhaps two, two approaches would be a standalone in a tagging on type of trial, Don. I don't know if that accurately reflects how we ended that call or not. Yeah, I think we, I, I agree with you. I think we're waiting for to see where AZ's interests are. It was interesting engaging with industry around these concepts. We had to direct them to the mission of SWOG, as was already said. We're here to test hypotheses, not to help you manage your drug in the marketplace. So, yeah, well, you know, to, you know, this is a whole nother side of the company that actually, uh, that is interested in supporting this type of work that doesn't have to be tied to their drugs. It's not mandatory. I just thought we had a good trial in the works that happened to have their drugs that could could have some of this done. Um, I was just happy I didn't in, I, uh, that I didn't embarrass you, Kathy. So I, I was pretty happy with that. <laughs> Never done. Never. I know Dan Hertz is on. Um, Dan, do you want to say anything about your your concept? I want to give you the opportunity. anything much to add. I just appreciate uh, your guidance and feedback and everybody's efforts on this. And I would love to see us get involved in something, obviously I'm biased, but something in the wearable space. I like the concept around the aura ring, something that's really engagement with a digital tool rather than sort of a, a online platform or AI approach would be really exciting to me. All right. And no, no. So um, Dr. Graf asked um, if they're willing to phone. Frankly, I'm not sure what they're willing to do just yet. <laughs> I think Kathy Crew, <laughs> I think Kathy Crew agreed. They, were, they liked them all. 
And at the end of the day, Dr. Albain said, we really need to narrow and try to find something we can test. Oh, there's a question, please, come on. Just introduce yourself. Uh, hi, Barbara Segarra, I'm a patient advocate for the cancer care delivery. Welcome. And for my accent, you can say yeah. I'm Puerto Rican. Um, one question, because uh, as you evaluate this concept and we are um, moving so uh, strongly for in diversity and inclusion, um, I think it's something very important to look at these in other languages and when you're gonna prioritize um, to give that opportunity and access. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, that's being included and, and the road that you guys will have to really choosing things that will have an impact in, in many communities, especially in Hispanics or Spanish speaking. Thank, Thank you. you for that. And yes, we do have a commitment to diversity and equity uh, within SWAG. I know it's been an issue with PROs to try to make them more widely available in non-English languages. Um, fortunately, I think um, uh, more, many of the more common ones that are used are available in Spanish. Um, but yes, this is something that we do need to look at. I appreciate the comment. Please. Mike. <laughs> That's the nice thing about the wearable, yeah. is there would be no barrier there, which right. would be fabulous. Correct. Even with something like a, a text messaging system, certainly you could develop text messages to every single language. The issue there, I'll just let you know in advance, is we would be stepping into an area where the guidance from OHRP and IRB is not entirely clear about what language, what needs IRB review before you send it out. So that's just one thing that we're thinking about. Hildy. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, all of these studies, I think, are so interesting. I'm curious with the ring that's detecting symptoms of cytokine, cytokine release syndrome. I know from my experience with uh, uh, working with lymphoma patients, especially that have been on CAR T uh, trials, that they don't necessarily identify their, their symptoms as something that they should go to the emergency room for or anything. Does it alert? the patient to be proactive to either at least call their clinician or go to the ER? Is there any interaction with the patient? There is not. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, there's nothing. It's, it's literally passively collected. It's okay. interesting, the aura just um, looked at changes in temperature, vari or ch uh, temperature variability as an early predictor of COVID. Right. And they've actually published their data I can't read any of it because it's very complicated. It's not a simple, does it work or no? They just gave you a lot right. of figures. Apparently it worked, but it was retrospectively looked at. So there okay. is no warning signal. Yeah. Okay, okay. And then my other question is, at, um, and maybe it's a question for Dana, because I sit as the advocate on the, exec on the SWAG executive review, since many of these studies may be inviting <clears throat> our committee chairs and investigators to be thinking about trials that they're running where this might be a nice, any of these might be uh, something they would like to offer their patients. Um, at what point would we introduce it to our committees so that um, they could say, well, if this does get approved all the way through, we would be interested in participating. Thank you for that. So we <laughs> have actually DE reps on all of the disease site committees. The goal was for you guys to go back and say they presented these really interesting things. But this one stuck out to me. Happy to make the slides available. If anybody wants slides on what these are, Frank. I would love slides. Yeah, Frank can again let you um, have a copy of these proposals um, so that you can take it to the committees because otherwise we won't know. Um, yes. Mm. So Dan, there was just a mention of a, a breast study that could potentially incorporate um, the ERCIPN uh, app. That's Dawn and Melissa's study. I think they might be a little bit too far along, but I will definitely reach out to them and see if they still think it could be potentially integrated. Yeah, I just shot her an email, so she knows. <laughs> All right, let's move on. I'm going to bring up very good friends uh, uh, of this committee. I think we've been, they've been involved with SWAG for like four or five years now. Jonathan um, and Eric 
are going to come on and tell us what's going on with Cancer Briefs. And just, I'm going to embarrass Jonathan for a sec. He's not here because he's moving, because he's getting married. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Jonathan, it's true. Um, I moved from sunny LA to cold Denver, but uh, I wish I could be with everyone. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Just a thumbs up. Great. Um, so just a quick uh, reminder, we're about to show you guys uh, episode two of Cancer Briefs. Cancer Brief is a pilot study between Hope Foundation and PV4 DHN Digital Health Networks, uh, and it's looking to prove if media could be used to educate about cancer clinical trials. Um, some of you guys have seen episode two before, but this is the final version. The difference is it's much cleaner and also has Spanish subtext. So with that said, uh, let's let's you guys have it. control. Um, oh, okay, good. Yeah. What do you think about cancer? Cancer. That word. That word. What does cancer mean to you? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Being bald and sick. Taking my grandmother to the hospital. Chemotherapy. It's why I became a doctor. Hope. A disease that's taken too many lives. I I've been through chemo and it hits you like a sledgehammer. I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in middle school. My dad was affected by cancer. He was a survivor until he wasn't any longer. Every time I treat a patient with cancer, it's another opportunity to help somebody like my dad. Cancer doesn't discriminate according to age, race, or ethnicity. And cancer affects people of color at an alarming rate compared to the white population. According to the National Cancer Institute, black men and women have the highest rate of getting and dying from cancer. The disparity isn't just in the black community. Hispanics have the highest rate of new diagnosis for cervical cancer. Asian and Pacific Islanders have the highest rates of stomach and liver cancer. When compared to other races, black men are more than twice as likely to die. Twice as likely to die from prostate cancer. But we can do something about it. We can do something about it. You can do something. Cancer clinical trials. The National Cancer Institute, or NCI, is a publicly funded agency of the National Institutes of Health that conducts many types of clinical trials. Cancer clinical trials are how the medical community improves cancer treatment. Trials lead to new medications, new treatments, and new guidelines for care. Every major treatment for cancer was once tested in a trial. The types of trials that the NCI runs includes treatment, screening, prevention, and supportive care. They're done with the utmost respect for our patients on the trial. Respect for the patient. With certain types of cancer affecting minority groups differently. We need trials that research this and people to take part in them. Because right now, very few, very few minority cancer patients enroll in clinical trials. By not being in these trials, we aren't reflected in the findings. We need research and results that represent everybody. Everybody. Trial it. As diverse as a U.S. population. So the medical community can find answers that speak to all of us. All of us. All of us. In the black community, there's been a long-standing mistrust of the medical system. From 1932 to 1972, the Public Health Service wrongfully and unethically conducted the Tuskegee experiment. Black men were misled into thinking that they were being treated for syphilis. They actually didn't receive any treatment. People were not respected and people were seriously harmed. But from this awful experiment came many of the laws and regulations. That protect people in clinical trials today. Today, <laughs> clinical trials follow strict protocols and ethical guidelines. They're done with close supervision and rigorous oversight to keep patients as safe as possible. If we're going to improve cancer outcomes for our communities, we need you. It starts with you. You. If you or someone you know has cancer, ask your doctor if there's a trial for you. You just have to ask. So you can help improve future cancer outcomes in the Black, Hispanic, Asian, and Pacific Islander communities. For more information on how you can be part of the change, go to All right. Thank you, Jonathan. My pleasure. With that, uh, we do have a couple slides to show yep. quickly. Um, so 
yeah, let's quickly talk about the other um, campaigns so far. So uh, each campaign had a $1,000 marketing budget. Episode one was about what are clinical trials on a whole. Um, as you can see, we reached around 83,537 screens. Um, yeah, as you can see, the analytics of the, you know, 52,000 people watch it, you know, three seconds, 342 watch 25%. And these are actually great returns. Um, there is quite a drop off from three seconds uh, onto, you know, people that watched it for the whole amount. And we kind of saw the same thing with uh, episode three, which is um, a metacinematic kind of commercial, seeing if we could promote one specific trial. Um, that being said, we were really looking forward to getting this out. Uh, unfortunately, our, our boss told us not to. Uh, Don, he meant to reach out to you. Unfortunately, a, a COVID uh, diagnosis prevented that. But that being said, uh, we have something we'd like to present, which is, uh, oh, let's show the next slide too, please. Sorry for this one. Uh, this is the traffic boost. As you could see, the specific date that it was launched. So episode one, uh, it was August 18th. Each episode has a call to action at the very end, which is to go to a site. Uh, episode one was for the Hope Foundation page, and you could see the spike in viewership. <clears throat> episode three was to go to uh, SWOG's S1501 page, and as well, you could see the spike on the launch and when the campaigns ended. Uh, that being said, what <clears throat> DHN would like to do, next slide, please. Uh, yes, we have a hypothesis, which is if we invest some of our own money, more money into this episode three, can we increase um, a more targeted and exact and engaged audience? And there are a couple of reasons that uh, we would like to put some more money behind this campaign. Uh, the first being Facebook has changed how they do advertisements since when we first launched. Um, Eric, do you mind uh, chiming in here for a second on this? Eric, you might be on mute. I think you might be on mute. Give me one second. Oh, no, we hear you now. Okay. <laughs> Tell me if that's okay. So, um, so something has happened on the back end of Facebook's advertising while we've been kind of in the process of this. And that is that Facebook has made it um, more difficult to market to specific self-identifying groups, which feel particularly relevant to this episode. So that includes, you can no longer advertise, you can't specify ethnicities, religions, and these type of broad categories. Um, generally speaking, it doesn't affect kind of the big picture and the end game, only that it really kind of makes you start at a broader point and then kind of whittle it down using the algorithm. Um, that takes more time and it now is kind of taking a little bit more budget. And so for that reason, I think, um, you know, the idea was that we needed to probably bolster that uh, marketing budget in order to kind of get results that were a little bit more specific and a little bit more accurate. Uh, it just felt like we needed to budget for this extra, probably like two weeks of campaign um, to make these, uh, these numbers actually kind of worthwhile. Thanks, Eric. And I think what we would like to do also is increase budget is first launch a 15 second teaser, because what we realize is the audience's attention is the drop off after 15 seconds. I mean, we've all seen Dr. Don, you know, TikTok videos, who doesn't love them? They're amazing. And as we know, people's attention span is really that 15 seconds. But what that 15 seconds will get us is the analytics and numbers and who, who it resonated with, who was actually interested. There's no reason to spend money on a huge campaign that's what, three minutes and 30 seconds if someone's not even interested. So once we get those original findings, then we would target them and use the majority of the budget there to um, you know, show the full video. And then with the remaining budget, what we would do is kind of make final tweaks at the end to really hit the sweet spot. And I would love to see what the results are. Um, but again, once John is feeling better from COVID, he'll reach out. But uh, this is what we wanted to share with you today. And thank you for your time. So I, I'm going to open it up to some questions. So Jonathan and Eric, I, I, for the 
new folks in the room, this has been a labor of love that John and Eric has really done. This is a Hope Foundation sponsored project, really looking at newer ways to engage the public. So unlike all of the work we do, where people are coming to see us because they have cancer, one of the n hardest things to do is get the public to care about anything cancer related because they're not impacted. So I think the numbers here are really interesting in terms of the upshot that you had. There was just a paper, John, looking at, uh, and it was actually Emil Liu just tweeted it this morning about what happened with cancer conversations on social media when seminal events happened, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, um, uh, I think when Steve Jobs was diagnosed, and there were these little spikes that happened in those conversations. This is kind of mirroring that, John, which I think is really interesting that you are promoting some engagement. The, uh, uh, so that's number one. Number two is I would encourage you and Eric and the team to work with a select group here. And if you're interested, please let Frank know. Uh, I think we have sufficient data that perhaps we could um, uh, proceed with an abstract this year on, on uh, cancer briefs. And I would target Paris in September, the European Society for Medical Oncology meeting. And I'd be happy to go to present the work. <laughs> Me, but, too. What, me too. Let me know when that is. You can maybe plan your honeymoon around it, but, but there are some really nice meetings going on. It would be very nice to get this work out there on new, new communication because you have some nice statistics. And the third question I'll ask is, TikTok is now doing something really interesting, which is when you leave a video, they're asking, what did you think of it? I'm wondering, does Facebook have that ability now? Can you, if someone is clicking out, can you, can you um, immediately take a screen to them saying, were you interested in this video? Um, what did you think of it? And that might be really interesting. I don't, I've not seen that feature on Facebook, but if you're interested in, in taking this to TikTok, I'm your man. And we have a question. I know that Vimeo has that, like a thumbs up, did you enjoy this video? Yeah. Some, and then I think it uses that to suggest others. Yeah. And we have a question. Yes. Uh, Introduce this yourself. is Irene Tami from University of Texas. And um, <clears throat> I'm a Latina myself and I, um, I, I was quite impressed with your job. My only uh, suggestion is to run it kind of with focus group with Latina population, because I think that the speed of the subtitles is extremely fast for a low uh, level um, um, health literacy. And, and uh, that's quite perhaps the challenge for more Hispanic patients. Hmm. And, and uh, the other thing is, have you thought about delving? Because this has the potential, not just for the Hispanic population here in the US, but with all the network of cancer centers in the region. So thank you again, wonderful work. Maybe that's something you can do for 15 second teasers. That is yes. a good idea. Um, and it, it makes sense to test those things in kind of smaller, kind of manageable bits. So the dubbing, I think, has come up. We thought we would at least see kind of where the differentiation lied between kind of the English language and the subtitled. Um, but dubbing's a good idea as well. We have one more question for you, gents. Maybe just a comment as well. I think um, the general population had never heard so much about FDA and trials or investigators or whatever as they had in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we can make the link because that's what I did when people asked me about the vaccines, right? So I would explain how clinical trials usually work and how we got the vaccine so fast or whatever. So I think we are in the best moment for people to relate and the momentum to really uh, relate to that and say, you know, this worked for COVID, this is what we have been doing for cancer and other research uh, that way. And really, um, I'm always saying about this, that we have to talk about um, clinical trials that uh, Jonathan is trying to do um, all the time before even people get sick, right? So when you get sick and you hear about a trial, you, you don't have to struggle to that. You already had heard all the good stories and all, but really to a fourth grade level. We have to go down there so when they get exposed, it uh, could be. So that's my comment. I like it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to circle back to answer the question, we did consider dubbing. One of the reasons we didn't, it was cost prohibitive. 
because uh, we would have to hire someone in various languages to do it as well. So kind of a happy uh, medium was the subtext in Spanish. But uh, I think we do need to test it to see if it's going too quickly. And thank you very much for that comment. That sounds good. And just to, just to realize that, you know, Tuskegee, I always thought that it was something that happened in the past. It was really Karen Wingfield was mentioned as like, she was alive. We were alive when Tuskegee yeah. was still happening. That is shocking because I think a genera an entire generation under me thinks that we're talking about something that never, that, that is in the distant past and it wasn't. So. Isn't that amazing it's, that it's it happened when we were alive? Yeah. All right, so we're gonna move through some of our topics here and I don't wanna put anybody on the spot who's, a, who's sort of quote assigned to it, but we do have something, and this is something else for you all to take to your committees. We have developed the mechanism to create a social media toolkit for opening trials. And the first one who was um, tested it out with us was Dr. Gunturo, who is joining us via Zoom. Um, what? Any thoughts, Krishna? I'll, I'll wait for Frank to go through, John. And I'll... sounds good. I'm going to bring up Frank now, Krishna. Just wanted to briefly explain where we were, where we are, where we're going. Um, so the first social tool, uh, social media toolkit was put together for S2013, Dr. Gunturo's I Check It trial. Um, it was run in November. We um, did a week of uh, patient-directed messages and a week of provider-directed messages. Um, we tagged the study team members, among others. And these are just some shots of the graphics we used with it. And these are some of the numbers we pulled, um, which I will go into in detail on the next slide. Uh, so almost 37,000 impressions over the, um, those initial two weeks and the subsequent <coughs> weeks. Uh, 532 engagements and engagements are any interaction with the tweet. Um, clicks, retweets, replies, follows. Um, I think what's most interesting is that there were 86 clicks on the links we provided, and those are what we're trying to do, trying to drive people to those links. Um, twice as many on the provider-directed links, which go to the um, trial pages that are already in, in existence on the SWOG website. Um, but we're also going to be creating a page for uh, every new trial opening with a simple URL that's just swag.org slash the number of the trial with the patient directed material. Um, of course, after these two weeks, um, we've posted individual tweets at intervals after that. Um, the other component in all of this is the patient friendly summaries. So the plain language summaries, which you've all heard discussed for a while, but now we have Amanda on board producing them. And um, we have half a dozen at this point, the patient-friendly summary and social media toolkit that are either with CIRB or almost with CIRB. We have another half dozen at some stage of drafting. And what we're focused on initially <coughs> is having them available for all trials at launch so that our members can come to expect them at launch. We've also started working through the backlog of active trials. That's going to take a little while. We've started with trials that need help. Um, so Amanda drafts the patient-friendly summary. I draft the social media toolkit. They go to the study team for review with a checklist. Um, eventually go to CIRB. We've gotten some initial feedback on, I think, just one from CIRB thus far, and it was just minor. Um, it hasn't been approved yet, though, um, apart from the S2013 one back in the fall. But we're also trying to advertise these widely at this meeting. So um, in a number of sessions, you'll hear these things referred to, um, Digital Engagement Committee, obviously, but also the Oishi Symposium, the ORP Open Forum, and even at Plenary 2. 
Um, we're also working to make them better, make the process better. Um, Social Media Toolkit now includes a um, tweet that sites can use, um, a CIRB approved tweet sites can use, just dropping in their site name and letting people know that the trial is open at their sites. Um, we've expanded the number of study team members that we feature on graphics um, because my sense is that providers who recognize a face are more likely to, um, to actually follow through. Um, and right now with the patient directed ones, we are sticking with graphics as opposed to photos, but down the line, I would like to run them against each other on the same trial to see which gets more response. Just some pictures. Um, you'll see these around on tables at the meeting. Yeah. And these are some of the social media toolkit pieces that are um, either with CIRB or about to be with CIRB. There. So, yeah, the takeaway is um, look for them and use them. So we'll pass it on to Dr. Gunter. Go ahead, Krishna. Any comments? Thank you very much, Frank and the DE team. Proud to be the first uh, social media kit. Uh, launching for S2031. So this, I felt um, it was geared towards uh, both uh, providers and also uh, for our patient population uh, to give them information with the changing world now um, with the social media being used more than before uh, to get the word out and education and uh, spotlighting this study, which could be helpful. Um, so welcome any feedback on how we can uh, make this more interactive and make it more helpful um, for our uh, researchers, staff, and our uh, patients. So I think one of the thoughts I had was um, we do know who's clicking through, but is there an opportunity to close that loop, say if a provider in Montana um, is clicking on what this study is. Is there any way to follow up with that provider to provide more of a touching a touch point? I don't know if, we're, if that that's possible because you'd really need to know the IP address by which that person was doing. And that would probably be the only. Is there a way to have just maybe something that says, do you do you want more information or you know on the wherever that's pointing to, just say. Click here if you want me to. If you want us to touch bases with you, that might be the one thing I have. Because again, it's about the directionality. I think is really important. Allison Rosen. So I want to provide a little bit of feedback. So this is just for Twitter, <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, the majority of patients aren't aren't on Twitter. I mean, people that are advocates are on Twitter. Is there any plan to do Instagram or Facebook or? TikTok. or well, I mean, I, I think you know if you want it to be a little bit more patient. Center. And, and, you know, ASCO does their stuff on Instagram now. They go live with some of their doctors. A lot of people are moving. I mean, Twitter is very important, obviously, for providers and, and, and the advocate community. But I think also if you try to do some of this on Instagram, you can ask people to tag people. And, and that has, you know, use hashtags more, more, a lot more hashtags to reach, a, like, a wider population. So, I mean, I'd happily help with this. This is something I'm, I'm really passionate about. And also, I didn't say it, but with the cancer briefs, is there any way that they could get like a TikTok to do their 15 seconds, you know, sort of, here's my teaser, that would send people to where the videos are? Just a thought on that one, too. You wanna, you wanna handle that? Any comment back, Frank? Um, we are not on Facebook. Um, we were on Facebook and backed off. Um, yeah. You have to look into Instagram. Probably Facebook further as well. I think it would be great to hear from the advocates on DE where your communities are. I think that would be really helpful information for us. I'll give you a little bit more information. Yeah. So I posted something about um, a trial, actually, um, this morning. And I posted it on Twitter. I posted it on Instagram. Um, I posted it on LinkedIn. And I posted it on Facebook. And the majority of people, I want to say within the first five minutes of me posting it, um, about 20 or 25 
patients on Facebook said done, done. And it was a survey, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything crazy, but the majority of, and, and I focus a lot on, you know, I work a lot with the AYA population, but also colorectal cancer. So I think it's also about the messaging, like a video on Instagram versus a post on another one. There's so many different tactics. We could have a whole meeting just talking about it, but yeah. the majority of the AYA population is gonna be on Instagram or TikTok. Some are older people are on Facebook, some are on Twitter, but yeah. not a lot. I just wanted to mention, Allison, I would love to get on the agenda for the next, or upcoming patient advocate committee meeting so we can discuss this further and yeah. download data. 100%, I have it, I have it. But you are certainly recruited to help with the social media toolkit. <laughs> And I'm just me tooing on Allison's comments. I mean, Don and I just published in JCO Oncology Practice on <coughs> social media for professional development, and all the references for the patient advocacy community were Facebook groups, and, and they're cited and published and listed numerous different, across different um, tumor types. But Facebook is also relevant in the physician community. The Hemonc Women's Group, I just checked, is at 1900 members and we would we're always talking about trials and searching for trials for our patients so posting the physician link in that group would be good mm -hmm. and i know gill is on remotely i just pulled up onco alert on instagram has 6800 followers so i mean i think that outside of twitter there's other physician and patient communities thank you dr graf one more comment yeah thank you um, I was just hoping that naturally that all that you have shown before us that, and the links that are to come, especially about new trials, would be linkable, if that's even the right term, to, for example, uh, other patient advocacy sites or patient forums. I see a lot of things on smart patients, which yep. can be subdivided into different cancers. And, uh, and then I have to admit, I don't do Twitter. <laughs> I'm too old or something. I still use pencil. Until so you have to be on Twitter to be in this room, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> throw, I've been thrown out for less cause. <laughs> but, no, but it's all. a very good point. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think it's very important that all the paper copies will be in paper. And again, printable again on PDFs mm. and so on, because... Um, People take that home and they may not understand, but that's a lot easier to get someone to read this than go on your computer yeah. and find the thing I forgot yeah. where it is exactly. I'm speaking for myself. I'm forgetting where it is. But to make that very easy because, and assuming that the doctors are going to provide that printed material mm -hmm. to the patient is an overreach, yeah. I think. So patient to patient is uh, safer and, and credible in, in most cases. And uh, keep doing more patient-friendly summaries of what trials, and people will probably sign themselves up. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. So there's a couple of comments. I'm gonna read them out so that the folks who are joining us on Zoom um, know that we are looking. So Banu Symington, my friend from ASCO, actually made an interesting point for us to think about that when we're talking about immune checkpoint, many patients may not know what that is, because they know the brand names of the drugs. Uh, so they may not have interacted with it due to not understanding it actually applied to them. Something, something for us to maybe beta or test A versus B with this. And then uh, there is a- um, Don, can I comment on that before you move on? Is yeah. That okay? Yeah, thank you. Um, th thank you very much for the valuable feedback. So given the social media with the short uh, uh, space and only a few words, um, there is a uh, summary, one, one of the slides that Frank showed. It has more information uh, for the patient uh, education, what these immune checkpoint inhibitors are. Um, I know by uh, now these more and more immune checkpoint inhibitors are coming. So to add all of those names, um, it's going to take uh, a lot of space to I think, for, especially for your trial where it's not specific to a drug, that's a really important comment. Then we have one from Roxanne Tapasio. What if the interested person replies or interacts with your tweet because they're interested, but that it's not open locally? What can we do to help them um, enroll? <laughs> Krishna, that's to you, Krishna. 
Well, I think I'm going to call on Don. Dr. Hirschman, would you like to? <laughs> you can call a, a phone a friend or phone your lifeline, yeah. right? So <laughs> I do think it's, it is an issue, and I think it goes back to what we were talking about in terms of widening clinical trial availability. But I think that point where if someone says, you know, I want more information, that little, that might be the one thing. And then if, if NCI gets it back to them or if we have the capacity to get back to them, that would, I think that would be good because then we would know. All right, so we're actually out of time for this session, but I have my presentation is not going to take more than 10 minutes. So Gil, Gil Morgan of OncoAlert, do you want to say anything about uh, what you're up to and how SWOG can help? Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah, excellent. Uh, if you want, I just made a quick uh, here uh, presentation. If I could just share my screen. Is it okay? It's up. All right. Wonderful. Uh, so if you guys can see everything, uh, once again, sorry, I could not make it to Seattle. I really wish I could have, but the, the clinic did not allow me. Uh, so I am the director of OncoAlert. And uh, just uh, for anyone that doesn't know OncoAlert, uh, we are a network on social media, different platforms made up of uh, medical, radiation, surgical oncologists, cancer scientists, uh, oncology nurses, and most importantly, patient advocates. Uh, we have uh, different goals. Uh, it all started with the amplification of uh, oncology information, but we developed and we really have evolved based on the necessities of the oncology community. So these are, yeah, there's about 100 and over 140 people that make up OncoAlert. Uh, that's our website where we find a lot of our information on initiatives and who we are. Uh, and uh, when it comes down to uh, our platforms, these are some of our platforms on social media. Maybe they're not completely up to date, but it's Instagram, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, but our bread and butter is Twitter. We have about 26,000 in Twitter, uh, altogether about 35,000. Uh, we can't forget that this is, uh, they're small numbers, but we are a niche oncology network. Uh, so our followers are exactly those we want to engage with. And that is doctors, nurses, researchers, and of course, most importantly, our patient advocates. Uh, we have uh, been around for about three years, and now we've uh, been able to establish some pretty amazing partnerships. Uh, incredibly proud of our partnership with SWOG, uh, and of course, we have collaborations also with our friends at ASCO and ESMO. Uh, now, uh, starting with some of our other initiatives, uh, here the Oncular Colloquium is our end of the year uh, entirely free, registration-free, uh, end-of-the-year review uh, with an incredible faculty. And this was a week-long event, uh, and it was it's available on YouTube. It's still available for anybody. They just have to click in. Uh, however, like everything we do, the best way to do things is by collaborating. And we have collaborated here with the European Oncology Nursing Society, uh, the European Onco uh, School of Oncology, e Cancer, so most importantly, with SWOG. Uh, so uh, here in day five, we actually had the colloquium with uh, SWOG, and we had two great presentations with SWOG 1614 by Dr. Huang and uh, SWOG 1929 by Dr. Karim. Uh, and this was very well received, something that we can definitely fine tune for next year colloquium. Uh, but I, I think this was a great start to uh, the, the collaboration or the partnership with SWOG and having SWOG in the uh, actual colloquium. Uh, now, anyone that knows OncoAlert will tell you that OncoAlert really comes alive at every Congress. And here we have last year's ESMO. Uh, OncoAlert came out as Mo, actually more influential than the host society, which doesn't really happen very much. Uh, also, we were responsible for 50% of the total engagements, 50% of the 124 million impressions. That was on Coalert. Uh, so that was really good. Same thing goes for the smaller meetings like ASCO GU and ASCO GI. In ASCO GU, I think we were 80% of the most influential. And the ASCO GI, I think we were at 50%. Uh, now, uh, of course, these are not uh, the. It's not to to uh, brag about the, the numbers, but really what we can actually do. Well, we can amp amplify the message. We can actually increase the number of the voices that are available. We can make sure that there is diversity on the types of voices that are represented. Making sure that we highlight the needs and concerns of their patient advocates. 
Now, where our SWAC collaboration comes into play is that in every single Congress and meeting, we make sure that we amplify and report on all the results of the SWAG trials that are being presented. Uh, this is actually aided by uh, a lot of our uh, amazing faculty, which are uh, oftentimes part of uh, SWAG, that uh, alert us on it. Uh, so it's quite easy. Uh, so this extends also to the promotion of SWAG meetings uh, and meetups, uh, and of course, uh, make the public aware of SWAG activities and results, and including meetings like today. Now, I think that so far we have picked very low hanging fruit and it has been a great start, but I think there are, are other parts of uh, OncoAlert that are already functional that could be used by SWAG. Uh, and I think uh, today we have uh, discussed at least three things where I just like, oh, I could help with that. Oh, I could help with that. Oh, I could help with that. Uh, and well, not me, but OncoAlert, uh, even just on the last one, uh, when it comes down to uh, it, we have the following and the engagement on Instagram, on Facebook. I mean, use us. That's what it's there for. We, we have that partnership for a reason and we trust one. So anything that is coming out of there that you would like us to push, we will push. Uh, so uh, here, the things that I would like to work on probably in the future, uh, or at least uh, start naming is uh, with the Spotlight Symposium, which we had last year, focusing on patient advocacy, racial uh, inequities and global disparities. I think this is something that we could definitely team up with our amazing SWOG advocacy group and also activate our Uncle or Uncle Alliance, which is made up of different groups. Uh, this is one way of using the mutual synergy to make sure that we highlight the voice of our patient advocates. Uh, we have uh, been successful with surveys that we have done uh, with uh, uh, ASCO and um, with, I'm sorry, with ESMO and uh, Jules Bourdais. Uh, we have uh, had five publications out of these surveys covered, focusing mainly on uh, COVID uh, resilience. Uh, now, uh, I think this is something that we can continue to do and something that we could actually do with uh, SWOG. Uh, if just we find the right question. Now, uh, when it comes down to the other things that we have, we have podcasts, we have videos. Uh, recently, we're doing some uh, collaboration videos and podcasts with uh, the ASCO plenary series. Uh, so one of the dreams that I actually had is to uncle or to be able to provide information to our community of newly started trials and aid in the actual recruiting. And I hope that this is something that we could actually work with SWOG uh, uh, to increase the audience or to bring this information to the audience as the more the network grows, the more the reach is there. Uh, so I, I think that's all I have to say. Uh, I, I think there's a big potential there and I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Gil. It's great to be collaborating with Uncle Alert, which has very quickly become a, a very trusted voice in, in our field. Um, moving on, any updates from Jen Clamp or Nagla Karim on, on a paper? No? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm here, but I don't know. Do I have, um, I don't really have an update. Okay. So I'm, I'm glad to hear all of you. <laughs> Let, we'll, let's try to get that back on track for the coming year. It's been yes, very difficult. We, we fell off the wagon and we'll get back on. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. All right. So with the last 10 minutes, I think if you can draw my last presentation. So um, I'll give, tell you the genesis of the presentation you're about to see. Um, <clears throat> can I see it on Zoom as well? Was uh, I was asked to speak at a meeting from a healthcare communications company. And they did something called the five top trends. And two of them I thought were just fascinating. I'm, I'm really interested in seeing what everyone here thinks. So the first, oh, so the innovations are involving the brain, tattoos, and then I'll just end with Cosmo real quick. That's mine. So drinks, fists, and beer. OK, good. All right, so Neurable is a company that's out there. And they're looking at something called neurotechnology. It was based at a University of Michigan at something called the Direct, Direct Brain Interface Lab. <clears throat> and the question they're facing is, can you make sense of how the brain acts and make tools to measure certain actions, like their emotional state? And they're currently working with the military to increase performance. But they showed this video, and I'm not sure. How did, can you play the video for me where you are? Okay. 
what if the future we want, the technology that will remake our world, is already inside of each of us? What if the future is our brain? Unlocked. We see a future where patients with chronic illnesses find new independence, where we can monitor brain health data in real time and share it with the doctor, transforming data into customized treatments in the process. We're building a future where our brain can tell us when it's tired, so we'll always know when we need to take a break to boost productivity and happiness. We see a future where music listens to us, to the way we're feeling at a neurological level, with custom playlists curated for our current mood. We're building a future where we even communicate differently, by thinking, not typing, turning thoughts into inputs, where we can tell our loved ones we're safe just by thinking it. At Neurable, we're harnessing the power of the human brain to build the future we see. Not smaller screens and thinner bezels, not more technology, more human technology. We believe the future is a place where technology works for us while receding into the background. <clears throat> At Neurable, we're not waiting for the future. We're building it into the devices we use every day. Neurable, the mind unlocked. So the first time I saw this, I thought I could get fired if I was sending stuff to my boss <laughs> inadvertently. But I think it's fascinating if, if your subconscious were able to tell your doc that you weren't feeling well, or if we wanted to target burnout. <clears throat> I think this is interesting. All right, so the next one <clears throat> is something that Bill Gates is backing, and it's electronic tattoos. And it's built as where aesthetics meet biotechnology. So it's getting rid of your phone, or it's getting rid of your um, Apple Watch, and it's tattoos with, where, with sensors embedded in it. <laughs> so this is also currently being <clears throat> evaluated. So if we can play it. <clears throat> All right, guys, I got my Android phone here. It's already connected to the MCU, MCU unit inside of my arm. I'm gonna bring up the e-ink tattoo app now, which controls the display in my arm. So by default, I have a bunch of different tattoos loaded in here. I can now actually go ahead and load these tattoos directly onto my arm. And they'll just be there? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so I can go ahead and it's and you, almost yeah, instantaneous. Oh, oh. Damn, and it, it, you can just upload your own? Yeah, so, you know, we have our default tattoos in here, but in the long term, we'll have anything that can be loaded onto that. Yeah, can you and I can cycle through these tattoos. <clears throat> uh, so this is the wrong video. <laughs> So what this is, so this, co this company, there is um, uh, electromagnetic fields that are embedded within the ink. And so it reads the skin and then it transmits into these sensors, which is embedded on the tattoo and falls off at six months. So it's essentially the information you're getting from your watch, but in a tattoo form, which is why Bill Gates is backing this technology because he sees a future where you're not wearing watches or anything. You're basically, it's in a tattoo. <clears throat> so, just a, just a teaser as to what is going on out there. DE, I think, I want to make this a place where the network, NCTN, finds out about this new technology. And I want to be the folks who engages with these new industries who may or may not have even thought about doing work in the cancer space. Our current le uh, lead with these innovative innovators or partners is Sanjay Aneha from Yale. And Frank did develop a form for anybody who's interested on the industry side to work with SWOG. They can actually access SWOG and create a form. And then Sanjay would do the deeper dive. But the task I have for everybody here, because we're all in different places, is keep your eyes out for interesting tech interesting partners, and we can work with them to build the idea in the, the oncology space. 
right? And with that, I think we're done for the day, unless anybody has any comments. Oh, one more thing, sorry. We do have one more introduction to make. Frank, do you want to make the introduction? Oh, um, <coughs> you know that Kara has put together an FAQ on the website. Um, if we can move to the last slide, and I think Kara can say more about it than I can. Well, thanks. Um, it's, there's not a whole lot to say. It's more just a brief announcement. Um, on the SWOG website, we're trying to find new and um, ways to provide um, all of the information that our sites need to um, conduct clinical trials. So there's now a, a frequently asked questions resource on the website, and I just encourage you all to go check it out. Um, the other thing I wanted to remind everybody about is the clinicaltrials.gov website. In response to the question that came up earlier, well, what do I do um, if somebody responds back? How do I quickly provide them with that information? The clinicaltrials.gov website has all of the locations at the bottom of the um, of the link to that particular study and is often one of the most helpful things to our patients um, when they're trying to uh, determine if the, they are eligible for a trial. Thank you, Kara. I think this is very helpful, the FAQs. Does anybody have any uh, questions or comments, Naga? Um, <coughs> I mean, I think, you know, the most interesting of what we have been talking about is about the patient-centered uh, adverse events, the reporting, the communication part, because I think a lot of it gets to be lost. You know what I mean? Especially things that happen, people on pills, you know, for, you know, for a study and so on. And I was wondering if similar application can happen also to help with our clinical trials. Remember inclusion, exclusion criteria, the, um, you know, the, the things about the adverse events. I mean, these things, if, since we have a lot of trials, if, if there is a way, um, you know, to incorporate uh, those components to make things easier for investigators mm -hmm. and for patients so that, you know, they can be accrued to the yeah. trial, you know, looking into that. Yeah, I think that's great. I think so much of it is under in evaluation and validation, but I think in a, a system that sort of brings in bidirectionality for cross log is something that we can all reach for. I agree. Yes. Can I give a shout out to the three o'clock Take Action Symposium on, on American Indians, try to ensure equity and diversity and inclusion? Thanks, and That's it's on great. the fourth floor. 402. 402. Thank you. All right, that concludes on time. Thank you for coming to D, and I'll see you guys again. Thanks, everybody, for joining on Zoom. It's nice hey. to meet you in person. I know. Hi. Oh, good. Nice to meet you.